So the main things I think would be fun to talk about today is how your TeamX and Vim workflow has changed over time, or perhaps what things are standing out to you right now in the sort of era of NeoVim gaining popularity and yeah. this Lua-based thing that's come our way where we now get to use a more reliable yeah. <laughs> programming language to do things. Uh, yeah. I actually watched that video of you and TJ trying to make a Lua plugin and I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, this is not that hard. Yeah. And I know you're a JavaScript developer, right? You spend a lot of time in JavaScript like I do. And so it's like that having Lua being this approachable language is pretty cool, but I just kind of like to nerd out on workflow stuff. So I'm just curious, like what's working for you and how you think maybe what your lens is this many years later, what is becoming even more second nature to you with Vim? Because I have thoughts on that as well. I've been using Vim maybe as long as you or somewhere close to it. Yeah. How does that sound? Yeah. Sounds good. Let's leave this to be organic. So if you want to screen share and just start chatting, I can definitely share some insight as well on my side as what kinds of things are working for me. So I was just looking to see how long I've been using them and about 11 years is I've been using it for longer, probably 14 years because I was like basically forced to use it in college freshman year to do all of my work. Like we had to all SSH into a machine and then use Vim, but I was very basic in yeah. that for years. I had just the teacher's default Vim RC, which had like abbreviation fixes for like his name in it and stuff. So <laughs> nice. I just didn't change anything about it. I was just like in, and then as soon as I would edit a single file and have to go to another one, I would quit Vim and then open Vim again from the command line to the new file and just go like that. It's changed a lot, obviously since then. Um, but <clears throat> since that video in 2015, which I did as like a, just a, let's talk about Vim at a meetup here in Omaha. Right. And so I just like, I put that video together that day, just like an hour before, which is wild. Cause it has like 700,000 views on YouTube now. That's just wild to me, but my workflow, like I've kept it all in my dot files since 11 years ago and just kept it open, kept it, kept continuously improving it ever since. And probably... I honestly don't even know it. 2018, maybe I switched from Vim to NeoVim. So that was like the first of the major changes that happened. I think in that video too, I was using like Pathogen for a plugin manager, which was okay, but it wasn't great because you had to like, it was all Git based and right. felt not enable a plugin. You had to remove the plugin. So I had like sub modules and things like that, but switch to Vim plug or yeah, Vim plug for a long time. I'm actually on a branch right now where I'm playing with lazy. I don't know if you've seen that. But... Yeah, I'm about to try that this week. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, I like it so far. I got everything switched over and I'm just kind of testing to make sure that everything is working because I've run into a few pitfalls with it. That's just because my flow has been so stuck on Vimplug for five plus years, probably. Yeah. And there's so many cool things that you can do with, with this or Packer or like being able to list dependencies and things like that. I'm just so excited. But yeah, when I switched over to NeoVim, what I did was basically, I think at first I kept it like a VimRC and a .vim file. And then I, or symlinked to the NeoVim equivalents, the init.vim and nvim directory, I think in the config directory and kept it with parity. So if NeoVim wasn't working out, I could just immediately switch back to Vim. And I kept that up until probably 2020 or 2021, where I was like, all right, I was completely ignoring Lua uh, in the beginning. I probably jumped on like a month before the official release of the Lua supported NeoVim. So I guess I was still like slightly before it. I was running the nightly version to get on that, but I just completely ignored it. I was fine with everything that was there. I'm a TypeScript developer by day. And so I immediately jumped onto things like COC and... I think there was projects like Tsukiyomi or something like that in the early days that I was using right. along with like Ale and all of those plugins that like would give me my linting, my ESLint errors and things like that right in line, right. like a modern editor. And I was like totally fine with COC for a while, probably a year or two. But I just realized that I kept, I kept constantly having to run COC restart because it would just like get wild and nothing would work anymore. And yeah. So like it was just failing. The server was failing or something. And I was like, maybe I'll just give it a try. Give the native LSP client to try and see if that's any better. And so that's when I started digging into Lua. Like I use that as a an excuse to jump into Lua as well and have converted most of my Vim config over to that. 
and not dropped support completely for Vim because I don't at the right now I don't see myself coming back just because cool. it's so powerful. But yeah, that's I don't know. That's it's all based it's around the, some background as to like where you've been and a little bit of history. No, that's super useful. I would love to take a step back and just comment on your Tmux setup. So it looks like yeah. you have different windows being assigned to different projects. Is that your general workflow during the day? Yeah. yeah. So my workflow has changed a little bit too. When I'm working, I use this TM command that's in my dot files to create different sessions. And so when I'm doing like basically non-work stuff, I just give it a name of something like open source or something. And when I am working, I'll just create a new one that's like work. And then I'll start working in that one. And then I can like switch between if I need to, but then I'll have a project or like a window per project that I'm working on. Yep. But at work, the way that I typically work is I actually exclusively use get work trees now. And so the windows yeah. start lining up with the work tree brand folders that I'm working on specifically. And so yeah. I'll have like five or six of them. And then I just constantly switch between them because I'm like jumping into a code review here, going to fix this. Oh, quick hot fix over here and like just constantly moving around. And so because of that and the way that it, it works, like I know initially when I started working like using Tmux, I tried to set up like a script to, well, there was like Tmuxinator and things like that. Or I just had a bash script that would set up like, oh, I'm going to have a split like this and then a split like that. And my editor's going to go up here and my I'll run commands down, like down here and I'll do tests over here. But this would be right where I put Vim and do everything. And then do that. I don't really have anything like that because I just like on the fly create the splits that I need whenever I need them. And it's, it varies where it's sometimes like this, or sometimes I'll just have two and I'll have the, the server running over here or whatever, and Vim running over here. And then I'm a big fan of using the prefix Z to zoom in to one. So I usually just have yeah. them like full screen, everything else hidden. And then when I need to, I can just jump right over to it and, you know, do whatever I need, see the output, et cetera. Cool. But I exclusively use Tmux. I don't use, what is it, the term? Like they the, have the terminal, terminal in NeoVim, yeah. Yeah. I Do as well don't terminal. really use it. Yeah, and what shell do you use? Are you a ZSH guy? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I found it to be. So my workflow is very different from yours in Tmux, yeah. which is interesting. I have, like, this custom script. Are you familiar with the smart jump to directory CLI tools? There's a few of them, like FASD, there's a newer one called Zoxide. And so you can basically like CD to any directory at any time using like partial matching. Oh yeah. I use and the... So Zoxide is a library I use now that's built in Rust. Anyway, so I have a Tmux pop-up. I'll show you real quick. Let's see. We'll switch places. Uh, so here's my like start. And so I can just hit T and it'll give me every Zoxide result ever. And so I can just say dot files. And what I do is I create every session is a repo. Oh, cool. And at any time I can do command J and I can say, I want to open up like my website and it automatically creates a Tmux session on the fly. And so I could have this one and a Tmux, this one. And you could see like how quickly I can just spin up as many repos as I want. And they're all separate sessions. And you'll also notice I can switch to existing sessions using that same pop-up. And so I then end up having the name of the repo and this is the branch and the Git status is up in the Tmux bar. And so lazy Git is also bound to a quick command G keyboard command. And so I yeah. can like very quickly get into things. And if I hit Q, that pain just goes away. And right now I'm playing with this iconifying the window name. And so if I want to do Lux, I can just say PM run dev and it'll like change the symbol, usually changes the symbol anyway. And then Vim, when Vim's open, it changes oh, to wow. this. And so it's a really cheap, it's really easy to like to do. And I could show you, it's just, there's a Tmux. It's literally just a bash script that says if it's one of these things, then pipe out the symbol. So I'm going to turn this into a Tmux plugin is the next plan, but it's, it was a fun way to play with this. And yeah. you'll notice I don't use the number. I don't have those fancy little symbols. So mine is like an overly minimalist style. Um, but what's cool is just being able to create these so quickly on the fly.
Yeah. And everything's bound to like command W to close windows. So it's all very Mac OS feeling and there's no prefix involved when I use Tmux. Like I, I never use the command B, control B, whatever. Like I use command based keyboard shortcuts to do everything. And so it's like extremely fast, extremely ergonomic. Everything's about two keystrokes away. Technically, I guess it's one corded keystroke away from everything that I want to do. Yeah. And I still have my splits, which are also set up with a command based keyboard shortcut. And I can do command Z to zoom in. And yeah, it's just, it's funny how you see people work with the same tool, but have a totally different workflow in that my sessions are repos and your windows are, your session is literally a session, which makes sense as well. And then you use your windows to work through your projects. Yeah. But I have found this little pop-up, this smart manager to just be so incredibly quick to do whatever it is I want to do. And so I can, like you said, I was dealing with the Tmux like session script generators, like what I forget what some of them are called, but it'll auto scaffold your Tmux session and it'll set up all your panes in a certain way and run certain commands. And I was like, no, it doesn't really matter. You'll notice I ran this D command. So it's literally a script that, so here's the thing. I'll go back a second, I guess. In general, everything important that I do is about one keystroke away now one or two keystrokes away. That's like everything, like starting a script, switching a session, opening them, like everything is one to two keystrokes away. And so this guy got files. Let's see. Bin D. I'm trying to remember if I have this. It's just, hey, I use Yarn and PMPM and NPM in different projects. And I don't always know which one's going to be. And so basically I've just decided if I run the letter D in a project, that's a node-based project, it's going to detect which it's which package manager is being used and yeah. then run the dev script. So this is a PMPM based project. So to just automatically run PMPM run dev. And if it was a yarn project, it would do yarn dev. And if it was an NPM project, and so it just works. And so again, pretty much everything I need is two keystrokes away or one keystroke away which was a big game changer for me when I realized yeah. how, and again, there's 10 years of doing this, right? So it's like, yeah. how far can I get with, it doesn't really matter how fast of a typer I am. I've realized now that I can just be, just not type, just literally just hit one key and hit enter and it's 90% of my day. And so by the time I get into Vim, then I start typing. Yep. Then you have to, and then, and again, we could talk a lot about, I'm sure, even Vim things where we get really efficient or it's like use macros all the time, every day. Don't even repeat yourself, which yeah. I know you've talked about in, in your original video. But yeah, so that's how our TMUX sessions differ from each other. That's fascinating to me because like, I really like it. A, I love the way that it looks, the icon based approach for everything. Like, yeah. I'm immediately trying to think, how can I do that? <laughs> I do think like for the way that I work, like when I'm working, having the separate windows for when I'm working, it's usually the same repo because we use a mono repo and it's usually the same one or two projects within that mono repo that I'm even working in. But yeah. I create a new work tree for every branch that I'm doing. And then I have some standard ones that just stick around forever, like the main. So I can always run main and see what how things look before I started screwing things up. And then I have a review one where I just like constantly, I use the GH CLI, do code reviews where I'll check it out into that yeah. work tree and then work with it. And so just having the names of the projects and I can have it where it automatically names the window name based on the branch that I'm on. So that okay. goes up in the top and that's the way that I use it to see it. But now I'm like, I really should try and do this because yours looks so clean. I loved that. Oh, thanks man. Yeah. <laughs> Minimalist and clean and yeah. simple and ultra efficient are my main values. So mm -hmm. I'm building my setup. Now I am curious and I have started playing around with work trees but like, how do you get away with, I guess the main one is like, how do you get Vim to play nice with your work trees where when you open it up and you say, I want to find a file, you're only looking at the files in the specific work tree, not like everything in the whole, like across all projects. Yeah. So I, when I do that, I'll create the new window and then I will CD into 
that branch's directory okay. specifically. So it's only ever that branch. Now, like when I'm working on my day job stuff, like this, it's a monorepo with like 115 projects. Like telescope is fast enough. I use a plugin with telescope to let it use FZF under the covers. That's mm -hmm. what it's like. It's really fast to find things in there. And yeah, I guess I don't see a, too much of a problem, but like for each work specific work tree, I run like an individual instance of VIM. Also, I call it yeah. Vim so per work this. trees per VIM. So I still have an old plugin I, that's I've kept up with. It's called VIM Rooter, and so it when you open VIM, it decides okay, this is the root of the project, and I'm not uh -huh. going to change what my root of the VIM instance is if yeah. I open up a new file. But the thing I'm running into, and the thing I haven't solved for yet with like work trees is if there are like a feature branch and the main branch are both living in this Git work tree. Like I haven't found a clean way to tell Vim, Hey Vim, like when I open up this branch, this feature branch that's under this work tree, okay, only look at the files in the feature branch. Cause I don't want duplicate files and I don't want to get lost. Yeah. So I haven't like fully embraced I haven't fully embraced work trees yet. Uh, so that's I, where I've landed with this. Yeah, I think I'm getting it now because like when you do work trees, like you might put the folder right in the same work tree, working directory. Is that kind of what well, you're thinking? So you, yeah, so you have a root fold. Like I read your PMPM workspace article, which was like a nice kind of soft introduction to how you're doing things. Yeah. And I realized that like my Git... I use lazy Git. So this Git based thing, it has to detect it as well as when I open Vim, I'm going to have to be able to detect that, that that works. Yep. And then finally, the other trickiest part of all this is like my current team accession manager thing is all based off of folders. And so you end up with the organization name being the parent folder and then the branch name being the, the name of the main directory holding all the files for each work tree instance. And I'm like, okay, so I don't want team accessions named main or master or feature branch because it's not quite enough for me to remember or to know which one's which. Uh, so those are the current kind of challenges that I'm faced with if I want to like embrace that work tree workflow, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if it would help. You said you read the article, so maybe not. The Like I use a bear clone of it, yeah. so it, it's like very much when I like see into or CD into the directory where all of the work trees live, the only thing that's in there is a folder of the work trees and then two hidden files or a dot bear directory and a dot get file that points right. to the dot bear. And so once I'm in there, I can do like the basic get things. I could look at the branches. I could look at the log of things, but I have to specify the branch that I want to be on because I'm technically not on a branch when I'm in there. And then from there, I just CD into one of those folders. So I might CD into main and then now I'm on main and I can do main level things where I'm rebasing or like branch level things, not main level and kind of working from there. But once I'm in there, it, because it sees the dot git file, it, it recognizes all of that. It's just, there's no, there's no like default working directory. I just have a folder full of working directories. Cool. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I'll, I have stuff to think about, so I'll be sure to ping you if things come up with get work trees that I'm still like trying to work through. Yeah. But it is, it's cool to see. And I think it's exciting to think that like you can have like your master branch checked out at the same time as your feature branch. And like you said, like you could just switch and start the server and do your tests. And then when you want to look at the baseline, you can also spin that up. And I'm assuming your like dev server can incrementally open ports. And so you just end up with, I could have both running at the same time if I want to. Yeah. So that's cool. That's really cool to see that, that you're finding productivity with that tool. And I think it's the Primogen has started to make this more mainstream when he put out his video on it. And so it's like oh, yeah. this, this feature has been around a long time, but I don't think we've leveraged its ability to make us more productive until recently. Yeah, exactly. It's, and it, I guess it depends on how you like to work too. I'm at a position now where I'm constantly spend more than half the day, probably jumping in and helping other people with things or yeah. testing things. And so I'm, I've never really been a fan of the stash. And so I basically treat like <laughs> yeah. the individual work trees as separate stashes and I don't have to do it. Then I can just create the commits as I need, but I can also run things simultaneously, which is fun too. That's cool. Yeah. Do you want to get into Vim a little? <laughs> I want to know more about like your LSP setup and maybe we look at your like 
and at Lua and see like how you've decided to put things together. Yeah, let's do it. So go back. I was playing with some things. Yep. Okay. So first off, I always just from muscle memory, I had I just have Vim alias to NeoVim. So I just like always type Vim and talk about NeoVim as Vim. Yeah. Nice. Oh <laughs> yeah, it, totally. I just hit V, literally this letter V oh, is yeah. a command. <laughs> I think I have E. Oh no, I don't. I thought I did. C, no, not C. Yeah, I just, I'm so used to it now. I just Vim. type that. Oh yeah, muscle memory. <laughs> yeah. And this is, uh, I'm familiar with this screen. So you got yeah. your all your kind of, your entry point to a project. It just looks better than the, the default screen. Which uh, of these sure. do you think you reach for the most? What do you mean? So are you just oh, hitting the time? Yeah on that top entry no i actually don't really use any like i always use it says leader t i'll do that i won't ever hit like, enter or go down through these honestly this is more to stop me from some basic questions on the dot files repo <laughs> like in the issues and so this is much less for me i just i'll jump in here and then i'll immediately go to yeah to so tell us what i do now is when i hit v yeah. vim opens up and opens find files on open. So it's if I'm always uh, going to have find files, then when I hit V, this is going to pop up every nice. time because that's what I'm going to do with it anyway. Yep. But yeah, yep. I totally get the, <laughs> as someone who's now I'm doing the YouTube thing. And so it's like, all right, people are looking at my dot files and people are asking me questions about my setup. And so I totally get the, the need to offer some buffer yeah. pun intended for those people that are like, how, what is going on here? Yeah. Cool. So find uh, so, files. Yeah. yeah Telescope files. is the best. It I is. I noticed that your top bar on Tmux is up above and I noticed your uh -huh. telescope stuff is up above. I love that as a, like a Mac OS guy. Like I want everything at my line of sight. Was that like a very intentional choice for you? It was, but honestly with the, I think with a recent-ish version of Vim, I, or NeoVim, there was the ability to set command height to zero so that I yes. could have this bar all the way at the bottom. Yes. And so once I was able to do that, I moved Tmux up here so that I would have a distinction between the two because there was otherwise no buffer between yep. the top and bottom. And it just looked, it looked like layers of tabs that I didn't really like. So now I just yeah. have it like that. But I get the same thing. If I do actually use tabs uh, occasionally in Vim. And so now I have that here where I have like tabs mm -hmm. and then tabs, but oh well. Yeah. But yeah, I, so... The, the main thing that I use is Telescope to to get around. I do also have NVimTree installed, and this has changed a lot. I think it was probably NerdTree in that video, yeah. and I use that for years. I like the look and feel of this a lot better and just the way it works. I don't really use it too much except for when I'm less familiar with the project. Then I like having a visual, like being able to visually see everything. But for a project like this, I know where everything is. So I just, I know what files I'm going to be searching for. Right. So that's what I do. But yeah, I, so I'll go in here. Let me bring up my init.lua. I have almost everything written in Lua now, and I started off not knowing, I didn't know Lua, and I wouldn't claim to super know it well now, but it's gotten a lot better. And some of the things that I, I like initially did was like created this utils, let me open that over here. I do use splits in Vim a lot too, where I'll have things split up like this. Usually my font's a little bit smaller, so it looks a little better, but like one thing that I did was like this whole like custom way to make key maps because maybe I am misunderstanding or misremembering how things were but like in the early days it was much harder to make a, a key map in Lua like it was just really verbose and so I made like a helper that would give me nmap xmap imap all of these in a really easy way that I could yeah. use them throughout and so I have that and I need to go back and reevaluate if I actually need that or not but like I can pull things out and then I just have them as like local variables. So I have an end map that I... Yeah, these are bridging you closer to what VimScript was. So the abstraction is just a useful way for you to quickly make sense of it, which yep. I get. I totally get that. Yeah. And so um, like I, I set all of that up. Um, this is my lazy branch. So I have lazy as the plugin manager in right. this now, yeah. which I really like. I love this like interface. And I love that when things change or when you start up, like if you just fresh clone my repo now with lazy, it will like immediately pop this screen up the first time it'll install lazy first off. And then it'll pop this up and it'll just go through the 70 something plugins I have and install them all. Whereas if you fresh clone with 
Vim plug in the main branch right now, you open up Vim and you get a bunch of errors because it's expecting all these plugins to be there and they are not there. So then right. you have to run plug install to actually install them, kill Vim, restart it, and then everything's fine. So just a little bit more ergonomic to, again, lose some of the questions or issues that I, I occasionally get. I wouldn't say that I get a lot either. It's just a, on occasion. Yeah. So I, I do a lot of setup. A lot of this is, I honestly, it's, this has just been like here since the beginning. I do, I'm not afraid to use the mouse. Like I have mouse fully enabled. I do a lot of that. Don't really do much like right clicking in it, but I will mostly use it for like I have in Tmux too. I can switch between tabs and quickly just jump to where I need to go. If I have right. multiple splits, I can go in between them like that. Um, so I have all of that set up. I do turn off like all of the backup stuff just because they get in my way more than they ever help. And so like with Git, I'm really good about really checking in things quickly. So I don't worry about it too much. I'm trying to think of some other interesting things that I have in here. So you got your leader keys. Yep. Yep. Have that's you... set to... Okay. Paste. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Paste yep. toggle. You got your symbols. If you were to think about what plugins stand out to you right now as like being a productivity gain or useful or interesting, aside from lazy, yeah. what do you think stands out to you as the things that you're enjoying right now or being interacting a lot with? So the ones that I, I use like near constantly are obviously Telescope and some associated plugins with that. Like I, I really yeah. like FZF. And so I have like a, uh, I think leader FR gives me live grep where I can pass and I use rip grep for my grep as well. Yeah. And so I can pass like this, so I can say, oh, I want to look in all Lua files and I just start adding things in here and I can just say, yeah, JS. Right. And it goes like right down to that line cool. and I could do, oh, I want to look for everything but Lua files. And like, I can add those command line flags and just immediately get results right here. Love stuff like that. The other thing I'm like, constantly using is a classic probably is fugitive by tim pope okay I, just, I use this i've only ever really dug into git on the command line but this is the closest to a git gui that i ever use okay. and just being able to like see this right here and i can do equal sign to show the diff of that file and like i can see oh you know what i actually want to just i can do that and then i could do dash to just stage that part and so I can do the kind of patch or like staging of different various hunks yep. in right in this interface and then bring up the command or the commit editor here and immediately do all of that. Cool. So I really like that a lot. Yeah, no, so. it's great to have a really good Git workflow. And as long as you're being very quick and efficient with it and you're make always committing the right things, right? And doing it like precisely, then it's so cool to see how many people have come up with solutions. And I know that this one is like a classic, like most people really like Fugitive. Yeah. Then the LSP is a, I really like this setup a lot. I just, over this holiday break, switched from NVIM LSP installer to Mason to yeah. like manage all of these. And I really like that now. I think this is the third time I've switched projects yeah. on that all by the same guy too. But this, I think this Mason's does... cool. Do you yeah. have null LS and comp and all of that configured or is that pre-configured for you? I have comp configured. I haven't checked out null yet. I'm using formatter, Mike Cardington's formatter for that. And so I, that's yeah. what it is. It's like a linter yeah, that's, slash formatter type that's thing. That's what right? it's, it's purposes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I, I have that all set up through formatter that uses an auto command on format, right? To, yeah. or a, on right post to format any of these types of files. Yeah. I, I and I see you have your Git gutters, which is always helpful. Yeah. Actually, and... while I was, while I was switching over to lazy, I accidentally broke Git sign. This is Git signs. Yeah. Git signs. And I like, I felt lost without the, these markers in there showing me what I had changed. I was jarred at how much I rely on seeing <laughs> that line right there. <laughs> totally. Let me show you a little bit of mine. Yeah. And I'm, so I guess the main difference for me is my Git workflow is slightly different. And then my, I'm using Packer right now. And so one thing that you'll notice is this transparency. I have everything transparent, like my whole Vim editor, there's no top bar, right? It's like fully borderless and fully transparent. And so that's something that I've really enjoyed. So if I pull up like 
Mason, like transparent, and uh, I have info null ls and info lsp, and so like it's just all really clean, and that's thanks to this little invim transparent thing that helps me get all of the hard stuff figured out so that it's, I would say it's probably 95% in that state. So that kind of goes a long way for me. I haven't shown this off too much yet, but I have this thing, this little command line that I've built that auto changes the colors. So that's fun to do. That's cool. The question on that is that... Yeah. Is that controlling the colors for both Vim and like your terminal as well? So right now it's, let's do God of War. So this one, it changes the background color and it changes the colors of the terminal. And then my plan is to next overwrite the like Vim color scheme to work with tree sitter. So it's, there's a bit of work of, in front of me right now <laughs> to get this to work nicely, but it's cool. It's fun to play with. I've got, let's see, but there's like some alacrity has, I use alacrity. I know you were mentioning okay. kitty. Yep. And so that gets me a certain way with that. Uh, but tree sitter, of course, everyone needs tree sitter. This comment one, I don't know if you're using this one. Mm -hmm. There's a great way to deal with language-based commits. So like GCC to comment, like it works really well with every language. Like it, it auto detects language and, and understands chunks and hunks and things like that. But the things that are standing out to me right now are, so this is lazy git. So I can hit command G and it pops up a separate Tmux window at any time and I can hit Q to get rid of it. So it's very on the fly, which again, if I'm in the terminal, I can also hit command G. So I'm not, I don't have to jump to Vim then hit a keyboard command to get to my Git status. It's just always there at any time I need it. Oh. And so this one works very much. It's very keyboard driven. So it's HJKL. You can hit space. You can do the same thing you did. I can do specific commits like in chunks, that kind of thing. But the thing that I've enjoyed the most lately is I can, I have Git based commands so I can jump to different hunks with Vim key bindings. I can also stage a hunk. I can also blame, which is a little tricky if I... So one, I can toggle the lines. So if I don't want to see them and I'm using the neat nerd fonts to see them, right? So they're pretty. And then at the bottom, you'll notice I have git status and that's it. That's the only thing I show down here aside from, uh, I guess if we're, if we have the LSP set up, I'll have the LSP showing, but that's it. I don't show the mode. I don't show the file type. In fact, you'll see the file name isn't even visible. So like I've gone to the extreme side of minimalism. Yeah. And if I wanted to, I can get rid of and get rid of the line numbers. If for some reason I just decide I want to just do it this way and I can switch between and explicit, which there's this controversy of which one's better. And I was like, why don't I just set up my leader keys to decide which one I want in the moment I'm working? So if yeah. I decide leader line numbers are more useful right now, then I'll just literally in three keystrokes switch to that. And then if you're familiar with the bracket, the angle brackets, it's for movements in Vim. So if you like do, if you do just the angle bracket, it'll switch, it'll move between line breaks. You're familiar with that one. But if I were to... Say I want to move to the next git diff hunk, I can do angle bracket G and it'll jump to the next hunk. And so that becomes really easy for me because most of the time I'm going to go to where I've been changing code anyway. So it's a little bit more helpful than marks. I do use marks quite a bit, but I find that I need to like, I feel like I have to be dedicated when I'm using marks, like it's the same order. Like usually it's A, B, C, D. So I'll like mark A, mark B, mark C. But I found like, if I'm just changing the file, then I'll just use this bracket G to move to hunks. And that seems to be pretty quick. Speaking of, I know Harpoon is extremely useful. As of right now, I my Harpoon setup's kind of broken, so I have to fix it. Um, what is Harpoon? I'm not even sure. So it's written by the Primogen. And so the idea being, if I see like I have which key and tmuxconf, so if tmuxconf is one of my files, I can mark it to harpoon. And what it'll do is it will create like a list of buffers basically. 
And so this becomes tmux is now the first file in the harpoon. And if I wanted to do the which key, I could mark that one. And so that becomes two. And then I could say init Lua, which I haven't shown you yet. And so I group them here first and I can mark that. And I'm just doing leader comma because, or not comma. Yeah, yeah, leader, leader apostrophe, right? Because that's how we do mark. So something mm -hmm. similar. And so now I use which key to show me. I can do leader one to go to the first file, leader two to go to the second file, leader three to go to the third file. And so I can go up to nine. And the way that it works for me is on the feature branch, it's going to be like the test file is the first file. And then the main, like maybe the back end, like service file related to the feature is the second file. And then the UI component is going to be the third file. And so now as I'm working, I can just go, oh, test one, server side two, front end three. And it's not always that simple, right, with projects, but most branches are only touching a few files. So it's useful to have a way to jump directly to the file that you're working with. I'm, tr I'm trying my best lately to not run so many buffer commands, like buffer next, buffer previous. I'm trying to just say like, how would I get to the exact file I want with as little keystrokes as possible. And so Harpoon's a great library for achieving that. I'm literally like taking a list of things I'm gonna go check out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to my YouTube channel, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and so what's cool about this now is I have been playing around with this undo tree. I don't know if you've played around with this before, uh -uh. but this one got recommended to me recently. It's a visualized history of all of your stuff. So you can just be like, I'm gonna go back in time and you can go through each commit that you made. And if I were to make changes here, it'll bring, it'll fork your history and it'll say back here, you had this history and then you went back to this place. And then when you branch, you end up with a new history. And so it's very smart and took in measuring each change in Vim, which has been interesting to play with so far. It's definitely helped me in certain situations, but I tried Lunar Vim about a month ago, which is a group configuration of Vim. It's like a community distro kind of thing. And I found that it, it to be too opinionated for me, as you notice, like I'm going for very minimal in my, in how things are executed. And so it was a lot of like me turning things off and it was a lot of me like overwriting built-ins and I was like, okay, this feels weird. So I'm going to start with learn from Lunar Vim, figure out how they do the Lua config stuff. And then TJ just recently had that video on Kickstarter and I was like, okay, this Kickstart Vim in Vim project is cool. So I got some feedback from him and then Primogen also had his like, how do you start from scratch with NeoVim? And so where I've landed right now is this project called LSP0. Oh, and get this, you'll love this one, Nick. If I hit Commando, I can open URLs and I auto detect this GitHub like format of like user slash repo. And so if I hit Command O, I get a Tmux pop-up of everything listed in the buffer. And so I can say like LSP0 and, oh, why didn't that work? Oh, there we go, LSP0. So that's pretty cool. And so this project is doing its best to make it so you don't have to do a lot of work. And so I've combined it with LSP zero, LSP Lua. And by the way, if you put everything in InVim after plugin, I don't know if this will work with zero, but it does work with Packer. All of these files automatically load after your plugins run without you having to actually like hard code these file values in some init Lua place. So it's like, you don't have to hard code cap, capuchin Lua, diffy Lua, get signs Lua. You don't have to call those anywhere in your config. You just plop. Specifically to call those files. setup. You, you plop them in after plugin and they, and so you just add a new one, you add your config and it just works, which has oh. been really great. Oh my God. So here's the LSP setup, right? So I have I, all my symbols. I have the on attaches, which I saw you had as well. And then it got a little bit more complicated. I have InVim comp set up separately. I'm starting to play around with Copilot a little, so that'll be coming soon. Yeah. Like autocomplete Copilot instead of just the empty prompts that they give you. You can hit tab to choose the prompt. So there's a oh. little bit more available if I spend more time with it. Nice. And then Null LS I actually found this pro project called Mason Null LS. And so you just 
this is an overwrite for Astro. So I want prettier to run with Astro files, which is that new like front end framework that people are raving about. But this Mason null LS will take all of your Mason like linters and formatters mostly. So all my linters and all my formatters aut get auto set up just by running this automatic install, automatic setup. Wow. And so like prettier is just a specific overwrite, but like my spell checking and you would actually like this josh.com. Let's see, MDX. Let's do like how to set it prettier. Is it going to work for me today? Let's see. Let's see. Maybe this one. Yeah. So I have spelling, which is fine, right? Spelling. And then I have just maybe insensitive. Try not to use it. So I'm using this See, like called nice. Alex easily might be insensitive, right? You may be, you may make someone feel bad by being like, this is so easy. And you're like, oh yeah, maybe I don't want to use that language. Reconsider yeah. using sucks. It might be profane. So this, and then here's another one, annotation text on the left. So proslint. So I'm using a combination. I basically went through Mason and I was like, okay, Mason, what do you got for me? What linters can you give me? And so it gave me all of these. And so now for my blog and for markdown files, I can like check for grammar with Grammarly and I can check for making sure I'm not using insensitive language or exclusive language. Like it even talks about like gender specific stuff, like where you're like, maybe don't be gender specific here to be more inclusive. And it's like, okay, cool. That's Proslint? been fun. Let's do that's uh, Proslint and Alex. They're two different ones. Okay. And they, from what I can tell, they offer different types of feedback mason but you can see let's see for linter so alex case insensitive inconsiderate writing proslint is for english prose so it's apparently they have a list of rules from certain writing or an editor there's mm -hmm. like this just generic like global scope of rules for good writing and they put that there and then this one is a syntax aware linter for prose so it like helps you with specific languages uh, make sure you get things right and then c spell so i have i've been using c spell for years so this is my spell checker it gets annoying at this point so i have to figure out if i can like toggle it or something because like we're full of yeah so see it didn't is technically right but it's i don't want to like have to go out of my way to get rid of mm -hmm. this so over time i'm gonna have to decide how much i like these because it's there's nine errors and 14 warnings but they're all just opinionated like feedback on my markdown file so we'll see how far i get with that but oh and by the way sessions the reason i like sessions so much is i can uh -huh. hit command l to switch back to the last session so, nice. so you use your windows and you have to, you can switch between windows, but for me, it's, if I'm in a different project, I can go back to my other project with very quick muscle memory, but yeah, so that's null LS and this Mason thing made it way easier to set up. And then comp over time, I'm trying to get better with comp because like spelling snippets, some of this stuff is built in even conventional commits. Oh, wow. So I can be like, let's see. So this is like a git. This is called Comidia, I think. And so it gives you like this pretty Git overview of what you're committing. And then I can have, I do Git conventional commits. So I can see like it auto completes my Git commit, commit messages. This is so, awesome. So we might do something like this. And then I'm back. Like you jump out and you do your thing with lazy git and then you <laughs> can just hit q and you're back to wherever you were it doesn't matter if you were in vim or you were in the command line or whatever it was you were doing and i go even a step further with all this i can just see like vt to open tmux or v what was it vf for fish so i i use the fish shell and so there's not a whole lot here. Yeah. Here's the spelling. <laughs> it's like, he spelled all these words wrong. It's like, I know, but what goes a long way for me is, and so even like this, like I was talking about bracket G to go to different Git, like hunks, I can do the same with bracket D for like diagnoses, I guess is the, is what that means, but you still got go to definition and all of that. But what I found cool and what I may suggest for you, if you decide to go the null LS route is 
I have gotten extremely spoiled with this auto format on save so much so that I just always want it no matter what, if any language supports it, I want it. So if I'm in a Lua file, I can mess with the formatting and I can hit save and it'll auto format. I found out that fish has this built in. And so if I want to, let's see, I forget how to do it. So I have fish and dent formatting turned on to this language. I also have some basic fish diagnostics supported by fish. Like it just is built into fish. It's just included. Wow. And then same with spelling. Spelling is everywhere. So if I were to like start an if statement, I th come on. Yeah. So it'll be like, Hey, you're missing an end to balance your if statement. Same with like bash scripts, I think. Tmax, this one. And so I have this beauty sh, like, okay, cool. That's built into Mason. Base Mason gave me this. And so if I want to like auto format bash scripts, I can also do that on save. And so it's, oh, so everybody's basically come up with these like, opinionated formatters, just give that to me everywhere possible, please. And that's where I've landed. I think formatting, it's not too hard to set up format. Uh, where is it? So you have to do L null LS, you have to specifically ask for it. And the APIs changed a little bit over time. So this is the on attach for null LS. And you can say if the supported method is text document formatting, like that's, if it's included in the API for your specific client, it will create this pre buff pre auto command. So it will attempt to format your buffer before it saves. So it'll be mm -hmm. the moment right before it writes. And so again, especially with this Mason null LS, all you have to do is open Mason, decide on what formatter you want, install it and it just works. Uh, yeah. Now, keep in mind, fish isn't here because fish is just built in. It's just yeah. a binary part of, if you have fish on your computer, you have fish indent. That's just the way it is. And so Mason doesn't have to format or doesn't have to handle it, but it is automatically figured out because null LS has like a full like list of built-ins. So if you feel like losing an afternoon, just go to null LS's built-ins page and just read all of them and decide which ones you like. Because it's uh, the list is longer than just what's listed on Mason. Mason is a mix of what sort of external dependencies you need to bring in uh, yeah. to work with. And so they have even more. But it's been really cool playing with LSP. But I've noticed right now that my ESLint in a mono repo is just total, just doesn't work. It's just broken in many cases. So I'm not completely happy with the built-in LSP yet, but thankfully a lot of these people have some really cool libraries where they're trying to make it less work like this LSP zero and the Mason guy, like the people doing Mason and what they've done before that has been very helpful. And comp is a very reliable and helpful library, but I've realized that you have to, once you want specific things, you have to start reading the documentation and experimenting and like actually spending time with it. And I have spent so much time in the last month. I spent like 20 hours or 30 hours in the last month doing this stuff yeah. and then redoing this stuff. And I'm like, okay, cool. I hope it's worth it one day. And I hope it is like helpful to my YouTube channel or whatever, because it's so much effort. I don't know if you can speak to that any over your now like 12 years experience with them, but it's getting harder for sure. It's, it's a lot. It is. And I'm at a different stage now too. I have two small ish kids. So yeah. finding the time to dig into this is tough. Like right now I'm on my second week of like holiday break basically. And I'm really digging into it, which is good. Like I'm catching up after just being in maintenance mode for the last year, but there's so much, like I, I literally, I have 15 things listed right now that I'm <laughs> immediately going to go look at yeah. after. And that was just like you spouting off things like I'm going to go look at this. I really need to just go down the the Mason list and see can what you, all is in there. I was about to say, can you either send me that list <laughs> yeah. or tell me what on that list is the thing you want to know the most about? Because I love hearing feedback on what is standing out to people. Yeah. 
So uh, I'll send you the list, but the top thing, I don't actually have it listed as the top thing, but the top thing that I immediately need to go look at, and I was going to ask you if it's in your dot files, is that aw command that you have. I have wanted to do something like that for yeah. so long. It's its own repo right now. And okay. it, and it, I need help. So if you want to team up yeah. and use some free time this week or whatever, like I need to abstract the color scheme into its own format, maybe SQL, maybe it becomes like a, like a web app where you mm -hmm. can go to the web and you can view pictures and colors that match that picture. But then I need to update my script to support multiple terminals. Like you yep. use Kitty, I use Alacrity, they use different formats. But as long as you know what colors you want, it's just a matter of writing a YAML file or a whatever file it is Kitty needs. And then like, you, I could probably support most of them. The trick right now is figuring out a standardized way to, to set the color scheme on NeoVim because it uses, it doesn't use terminal colors. It uses like hex colors pretty much. So you have to like, I have to come up with a pattern that one, when you run the command auto updates, hopefully auto updates NeoVim and then being able to match every color exactly. As of right now, it's super fun to use. Like I, I have a handful of things I like. If I watch a new TV show or play a video game or something, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to set up a background and I'm going to match the colors. And I have a really cool idea in the future to have it auto switch when you switch TMUX sessions. Uh, so cool. it would be like, if I'm in the dot files TMUX session, these colors set and this background image sets. And then if I switch to my work project, there's some work colors and the work background is set. And that would be incredibly cheap for me because I do all my TMX switching with that script, that like smart script. Yep. And so just be a matter of passing that through. That would be even cooler. It's like, it's reactive to what contextualized to what you're doing. Yeah. But I'm sure there's some balance to it not being overwhelming where it's like, you're just jarred with things changing constantly. So I don't want it to be overly distracting, but as a design, like I have a design background, like I want it to look polished and clean and minimal and like really pleasant at all times. And so it's been fun playing with that project so far. So I'll send you the repo. Yeah, that'd be great. And that's something that I noticed that's very apparent in your setup too, is how minimal and clean and just pretty everything really looks. And I really, there's that video that TJ did about like your personal development environment. And like, yeah. this really is that I feel because the, like when you're doing this and you're looking at this, like you're in Tmux, but there's no real indicator. You're not really interacting with Tmux. It seems like you're barely interacting. Like you're, <laughs> I don't know. It seems like you're barely interacting with, um, I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say, but like when I do it, I'm like opening Tmux and then I'm at a shell or a pane in Tmux yeah. and I then launch what I want to do in there, whether that's Vim or a start script or, or something like that. I do all of that, but I'm like very aware of the tools. Whereas yours is just like, like it's e exactly what you want to do to where the tools disappear and you're left with your exact way of doing things. Regardless, the tool doesn't matter in, in that sense, I guess, is I guess how I'm perceiving it, which is really cool. Like it's all just integrated perfectly. Whereas mine is more like you can do all of this, but you're going to do it more manually. You're going to actually open Vim. You're going to open lazy Git or whatever yeah. and do it. You're using the tools within the tools and they're there, but yours are like, you want to work with Git? Here's a pane with that immediately set up the way that you want. And here's the editor yep. immediately set up and yep. super minimal. I really like it. It's, so, yeah. Thanks, man. I mean, the, of, uh, main, thinking the main things I follow are the most important like rule for me is do things with as little keystrokes as possible mm -hmm. has become my latest. Like I have a moon lander, so I have the fancy keyboard Oh, nice! and I have silver speed <laughs> switches. So the actuation is extremely light. And so that's, this makes it an incredibly fast, incredibly ergonomic keyboard. Yeah. I type a hundred words a minute, but what I've landed on recently in the last year and a half to two, three years is like, just because I can type fast and I can type better than most doesn't mean I should type more. It actually means I should type less. And so yeah. over time, my workflow has just become less and less keystrokes. And I've been a bootcamp teacher for multiple times over different companies over the span of my career. And then now I'm doing this YouTube thing. And what I've landed on 
you know, one as teachers, I guess we have to be mindful of how quickly we talk because sometimes I'm a fast talker, but at the same time, what's worked for me with this workflow is like, there's no time up here. Like my most recent video went over like how minimal this is. There's no icons on the desktop. There's no menu bar at the top. There's no dock at the bottom. There's no men. There's no, there's not even a frame in this window. Like it's frameless, right. And transparent. And there's no time. This whole side of TMX isn't there. And I remember back in the day, uh, me and you, your old video, you talked about like how, let's just turn this on. So you talked about like how you had your music playing right in your yeah. TMX status. So I could still I do still that. Do. Like that thing still exists. And what I've been doing is I'll usually drop this here. And so the album oh, artwork cool. is here, uh, like floating. I've been having a little bit of issues with this, but anyway, so like my music's there because I'm really music centric, but basically there's nothing up here. And up here, I just see the Git branch, which is useful at all times. And there's three files changed, super useful. There's one thing I need to push and I can, I can do that with literally two keystrokes. And then, yeah. So like you said, though, the point of TMX for me now is to just be, have context on a repo and have access to everything important within one or two keystrokes. That's what it's become for me which is crazy. Like literally now when I pair program, I'm like, man, I want everybody to have this. Cause I just, I don't want you to have to type <laughs> like even that feels painful to me now because I've gotten so lazy, so lazy. It's almost funny to me how extreme I've been able to go with this. And I do like, I told you already, I do a lot of Mac OS keyboard bindings. So like the most common and most popular is the command P. So command P opens up your files in VS code, like and sublime text and Adam and everybody who's been doing code editors for the last 10 years or so decided command P is files. And with VS code command shift P is for commands. So you can also see like telescope has a built-in commands autocomplete. And so it's like command shift P. So everything is like one step away from what everybody who's a Mac OS user is used to, but then combined with the smart script that like just gives you the project you want when you want it at any time. And for me, what has been freeing with this workflow is I can hit command W whenever I want to close because these work command T, command W and command like bracket. These work just like tabs in your browser up here. So the keyboard shortcuts are the same. So if you switch to like, I use arc now, command T for new tab, command W to close tab. That's just the way that it works. And so I can hit, I can close things as much as I want. I can even kill Tmux and it doesn't really matter to me. In fact, I have TD for T dot dot files. So like, that's the one I go to a lot. And so that, uh, so I can just kill sessions as much as I want. And I can reopen sessions as just as quickly as I close them. And there's no like mental overlook, like overhead to am I like, am I managing my windows? What's my session called today? Am I working? What project do I need open? Is the window set to the right name? It's now it doesn't even matter to me because I don't name the windows. They're just like, this is a terminal instance, or this is a Vim instance, or this is a, the Git instance. And it's worked really well for me over over each time that I try to go one step further with this workflow. It's fascinating. One question, are you using like a window manager like um, yeah. for Mac OS? Yeah, so it's called Yubai and okay. you would like it. I hate to be keep plugging my videos, but I have a blazing fast window management video that goes that over that in depth. And uh, yeah, so like when I create different windows, it automatically snaps things into place and then it fills in all of the screen available at all times. Nice. Uh, and everything for me is bound to the alt key. So like alt, I can do alt H J K L to switch between windows. I can do alt F to full screen it. I can alt T to detach it. And so, nice. yeah, the window management thing goes a really long way. And same with switching. I use the desktops ex- almost exclusively. Like one app is in one 
window, unless I have to deal with something side by side, which is not that often. I'd rather just switch wow. between screens. So I yep. get a full screen of the browser and then a full, and it's for me, it's just one and two. So alt one and alt two, let me switch between them. But yeah, I have a whole video on that. You can definitely get some tips from that. But yeah, again, one keystroke or one key chord does like 80 or 90% of my daily tasks, yeah. or at least the things most people are doing when they're trying to. So I did look at Yabai, but I couldn't install it. Or I didn't want to mess with it because I couldn't install it on my Mac, my work yeah, Mac, because yeah. you have to turn off SIP. But there's another one called Amethyst that I have played around with. I don't use it day to day yet, but it's been something that I've been kind of looking at that lets you get away with not doing the SIP. So SIP can... You can leave that enabled if you want like the basic features. Yeah. There's only a handful of features that like for me, like switching a window to another desktop space, uh -huh. that one is specific to disabling that feature, but yeah. the majority of the features work super well yeah. without it. But Amethyst has been around a while. It's a popular choice, but yeah, I think a good automated window manager goes up much further than good keyboard shortcuts because good yeah. keyboard shortcuts still have to be pressed, right? Yep. So if you can get rid of it completely, it seems to work out better. Yeah. <laughs> but all right, man. So we're coming up to the end of this recording anyway. Is there any final thoughts you have or anything you want to say as we close out? This has given me so much to look at and to dig into. I did just go subscribe to you as well on oh, nice. uh, YouTube. <laughs> so thank you for that. And yeah, I don't know. I just love, this is such a fresh concept, like the way that you think about things, which is, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it quite yet, but it's less about the specific tooling and about how it enables you as an individual to go and do your work in your own customized way, which is awesome. Half the time when you were doing things, like I was following along, but <laughs> I true. couldn't tell, okay, wait, are you in lazy git now? Or are you in like how it so quickly jumped yeah. to exactly where you needed? And because of the way that everything looks, like it's just so clean, like throughout every tool that they just all blend together into one. And that's fascinating to me. I love it. Yeah. Cool, man. And the colors, right? The colors yeah. all match up. And, exactly. Uh, the icons are all from that font. So it's all the icons are, I didn't show you this, but like the Git status, right? Like the Git sign bars and the thing that shows at the top. And mm -hmm. when I open lazy Git, like all the icons match. And so Love it's it. meant to be this like cohesive experience. You gave me a lot of inspiration back in the day with that video. Like I know that I've gone a different direction than you and I appreciate feedback you've given me, but yeah, this customized terminal-based environment is just like something I've nerded out on for so many years. And I'm excited to like put that message out to the world and hopefully yes. inspire guys like you to keep up with <laughs> doing better, like refining your workflow. And I don't, I think you nailed it pretty well when you said what it is you saw me doing, but I think my main focus is be ultra efficient yeah. and have a cohesive experience that's clean and looks nice. My friends, my developer friends like that I know in person, like they make fun of me sometimes because they're like, why are you trying to make the terminal pretty? What is the point of that? That seems counterintuitive or even oxymoron of some kind, like pretty terminal. What is yeah. that? And so I'm like, no, I want that. It's so efficient. If you ever try to open VS Code up nowadays, it just blows up like your yeah. computer blows up. And I'm like, that's not cool. And forget about having multiple VS Code instances running at the same time. It's almost not possible. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, it's like, I just opened like six repos in less time than it would take to boot VS Code. And so it's, you just can't trade it. This like ultra efficiency is just like, I, what I'm trying to do now is try my best to make my videos approachable because I realize that like I've done something that's an efficiency on an efficiency on an efficiency. That's where I've come to land now. Yeah. And so I realize some people can't jump to where I'm at. So there's definitely some accessibility that I'm dealing with of like, how do I make this accessible to people without them just being like, I don't get it, or I'm not going to remember to do that. Or I don't know, just there's some things that I've that have become muscle memory that I have to not untrain, but take a step back and go, okay, this is muscle memory for me. It is not muscle memory for everybody else, which means that I need to approach this in a certain way. I don't know if you have any on how 
I know you've done that some with your videos. Have you found a useful way to approach this for those that don't know what this stuff is yet? No, not really. <laughs> Breaking it down as Breaking much down. as possible uh, totally. is probably yeah the best. I also really like how like you really have you have a lot of tools in there which you probably don't use day to day. Honestly, I didn't even know about the telescope commands. Like I use telescope to open files and yeah. recent files and that's pretty much it. Um, but I just tried that. I tried telescope commands and it showed me all the commands, which was awesome. Yep. And then I think which key is another thing that I wrote down. Yeah, that um, was useful. Yeah. And so having, you have these like graphical ways of, you don't probably need them hardly ever, but if I was going to your dot files and start using it, like I'd be completely lost. And so would literally everyone else on the planet because it's so integrated to you. It's so specific yeah. and it's so minimal that everything that <laughs> might be important to people, like even what mode you're in, like, yep. You, I could see you dropping that though. Like you mm -hmm. don't need to know if you're in normal mode or visual mode because you're really good at Vim. Like you've been doing it for so long now. Yep. That's not really important to you anymore. And so that's my challenge in this like overly minimal workflow. But I realize that it works super well for me. But if people don't actually know what's going on, it's not going to be as helpful to like get rid of everything. Yeah. <laughs> like most of it's gone. Like even the icons, it's like, I don't know what these icons are or mean. So why, how would I know what's going on? Yep. Uh, so that's good feedback. That's a really good point. And I really like one of the biggest takeaways that I'm probably going to immediately go and start looking into how I can integrate it. I don't think that I could go just based on the way I work with work trees and that flow. I don't think I could go as far as you in into a session per project, because I would just be constantly switching sessions and it'd be, well, maybe I could, I don't know. My immediate thought is that's, I don't know that will work for me. I totally understand why it works for you and it's awesome. But like, the, it just made me realize how many things are clutter in my setup that I can really go and reevaluate. And then just, I don't know, that right. AW script just has me thinking back in the day I was using base 16, yeah. which was like, it was integrated there, with. There's some yeah. base 16 ideas with yeah. that whole, how it all comes together. Yeah. Totally. And yeah. That's just so cool to me. I'm using Capuchin now and yeah, same. It's, it just looks better and like integrates better with like tree setter and things. So things like are styled much better. And so I like yeah. making things look pretty too. And the old base 16 code doesn't tree, really tree do Tree 16 anymore. came along, or not tree 16, tree sitter came a long way for yeah. me where I was like, oh, like NeoVim is, this is so appealing, like more appealing than VS Code and all of these other modern editors. I'm like, exactly. this is like nicer. <laughs> yeah. So it's been cool to see that. But uh, I know, so Capuchin has a way to define your own color schemes. So that was my current way into getting Alacrity this wallpaper tool to work. It's some sort of file dump. Right now I'm just overwriting an existing file in the file system and then <laughs> system detects that file change and then it reloads Alacrity. So I'm hoping there's something similar I can do with Vim where it's like, hey, if you see this file change, just reload the color scheme for me, please. But we will see how that yeah. goes. That's awesome. Uh, but this is really fun, Nick. Yeah, I was. it was cool to finally meet you and talk yeah, about likewise. some stuff. I'm glad to have been an inspiration. Feel free to keep tweeting me. <laughs> Will do. If you want more <laughs> help with this stuff. Um, but enjoy your time off. Yeah, thanks. And likewise, feel free to reach out. I will probably do the same as I dig into to this and some of these. I'm going to be scouring your dot files for ideas and inspiration. So I, I have a whole dot files website now too. So oh, feel yeah? free to dive oh, into nice. that as well. <laughs> awesome. We'll do. All right, man. Thanks cool. a lot. Yeah. See you later. See ya.